Good morning, church. Now, I was told Sunday night that the PowerPoint flicked. Now, Jay has worked on it, so it's Jay's fault if it's not fixed. <laughs> There's a lot of factors that go into that. But if it starts, mine does not do that, So or didn't last Sunday. So if it starts doing that, and because some said it give, gave them a headache, tell me, you know, do a sign, stand up, shout. Jay, I don't know what you're going to do, but do something, and I'll be glad to turn it off. Hi. We're glad that you're here this morning. It's good to see you. Everybody doing all right? This is yes. This is no. This is. We are in the midst of a series. We began it last Sunday. If you didn't hear the lessons, they're actually on our website. You can go back and listen to them. But it's based upon the song that Steve, thank you, led for us this morning when we all get to heaven. This morning, I want us to look at the, the actually the second line of the second stanza. But when traveling days are over, we'll look at the first part of this stanza tonight. But tonight, this morning, I want us to look at this lesson entitled "When Traveling Days Are Over." Ultimately, we're going to get to that point in the, this series of lessons. We'll sing and shout the victory when we all get to heaven. But when traveling days are over, is reality. King Lewis, the, or King Henry, excuse me, the the eighth, you may have heard of him. 1500s, early 1500s, he was, uh, if you will, the king of of England. He was the one that had six wives. He was the one that established the Church of England. Why? Because he did not like the proceedings of of the religious people of his time, because he wanted to have six wives. And so he circumvented and began what is still still today known as the Church of England. But anyway, he did not want to think about dying. He did not want to think about death. And so consequently, he avoided every time every, the subject was brought up, he would avoid it. He was told all those that were in his inner council that as they talked to him, never was anything to be mentioned of death or of dying. And when he was out in public, he had instructed those individuals that drove his chariot that they never carried him past a cemetery to remind him of death. And yet, he died. The reality of it is, is that we live life in a continuum knowing that really one day death's going to come. One day we're going to take our last sigh. One day we're going to take our last breath. One day we're going to say our last word, providing, of course, that the Lord doesn't come first. And still, in, even at that, we will have our last sigh, our last word. Those traveling days are over. One day that will occur. When, we do not know. We do not know either, A, when the Lord's going to come again, or B, we do not know when we're going to pass from this life. And thank goodness we don't. While David would talk about in Psalm 90 that the days of our years are 70 years, and if by strength, 80 years, or reason by strength, 80 years, but then he says, but then we are soon cut off, and we fly away. Now, I know we don't like to think about death. We don't like to talk about death. And so oftentimes we center the subject of death and talking about death just to funerals. And we're not going to spend all of our time this morning talking about death. You'd walk out of here depressed. But I want us to think about our traveling days and when our traveling days are over. We have to understand, first of all, that life is a journey. At best, it's a journey. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Peter reminds us that we are pilgrims. What's a pilgrim? The idea of a pilgrim, we think of somebody with funny hat, and, you know, whether it's male or female, that always sat down at Thanksgiving and ate turkey. That's a pilgrim to us. But the word pilgrim literally means traveler. We're travelers. We're travelers traveling down that long continuum as we talked about. Travelers that are passing through. Travelers that are not settlers. Tra travelers that are only here for a little while. And so when Peter says that we're sojourners and pilgrims, he's basically saying this, folks, you're not here planted and will be here forever. 
you're passing through. You and I are just passing through this world. You and I, one day, there'll be a world, if the Lord hasn't come again, there'll be a world in which we'll continue to exist, but we will not be here. You see, life really is a journey. But we have to understand, in as much as life is a journey, there's so many things that go on and take place in our life. First of all, there are choices to make. You and I are free moral agents. We talked a little bit about this in Bible school this morning, the auditorium class. God made us free moral agents, individuals that can pick and choose. Remember in Joshua 24, verse 15, Joshua had been talking to the children of Israel. He'd been preaching to them about coming back to God. Come on back, come on back. And remember what he said? He said, you choose this day whom you will serve. And then he concludes that as he gives them really choices. He's talking about God's the Father. And he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now he said, you choose, talking to Israel, you choose. He says, here's your choices, but you choose. We used such passages as John chapter 5 where Jesus said, talking to the individuals that day, that he says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And then the very next verse, verse 40, he reminds them that they would not. We have choices to make. Life is full of choices. Some choices are minor and some are major. Minor ones you made this morning is what you're going to eat for breakfast. Am I going to get out of bed this morning right now, or am I going to hit the snooze button? What am I going to wear? Am I going to wear the black suit, the gray suit, the blue suit? Am I going to wear the purple shirt with the black suit or the red shirt or the white shirt and the four or five different ties you have to go with that? What are you going to wear? Your choices sometimes get more complicated. You know, who am I going to marry? Am I going to have children? Am I going to go to school? What profession am I going to be? And even... Those that are eternal decisions. Am I going to do what God tells me to do? Am I going to listen to him and I'm going to listen to his will? Am I going to follow him? And and in in doing that and in discerning what is right and wrong in my life, am I going to choose to do what's right or am I going to choose not to do what's right? And so life is full of choices, but life is also full of conflict. There's constant conflict. I said here a few weeks ago, there was a study done a few years ago that said that really as far as the world is concerned, there have only been 200 years of complete, total peace upon this earth. There are conflicts going on now. We don't hear about them in our news because in many ways they don't involve us. But not only are there worldly conflicts, but we are constantly in conflict. There's, first of all, we have conflicts with individuals that that live around us. Those that are our neighbors, there are conflicts with regards to, you know, you're doing this over here and it's influencing my property over here. Don't do that. Don't do this. And we get in conflicts with those neighbors. We get in conflicts with our friends. You know why? Because we don't all think a lot. We all have a different way of thinking We all interpret things differently and we look at things differently. And so there's a conflict there sometimes with our friends. But the conflict that mostly is involved and involved in every one of our lives at all times is conflict with Satan. The reality of it is, is you and I are in a war. We are constantly in a war. And that war is with Satan. Why? Because Peter says he walks about as roaring lions seeking whom he may devour. And he does it constantly. And so we're in that war. We're in a conflict. And so living life's journey, we're in a conflict. But then there is this ceaseless preparation. In Amos chapter 4, verse 10, Amos is talking to the children of Israel. And as he's talking to the children of Israel, he, he basically says, he says, you, you, you got to get your life right. You got to get back to, to, to God. But Israel would not listen And so finally, in Amos chapter 4, Amos is kind of washing his hands of the whole situation. And in verse 10, he reminds the children of Israel, prepare to meet your God. Because one day you're going to do it. See, life's really all about preparation. You know, life's a journey, right? 
And if it is a journey, there's constantly preparation. What you're accomplishing now will prepare you for what's yet to come. And then when you take on that adventure, you take on that step, it's preparing you for the next step. And so life is full of ceaseless preparation. Life is full of continual changes. We began a little bit uh, Wednesday night. We began the study in the Wednesday in the auditorium class on the book of Galatians. And I challenged the folks that, at the, that were here at the end of class to think about the differences or the changes that have occurred in church, mind you, from, say, 40 or 50 years ago till today. We're constantly changing. Life is changing. Look at your clothes. They change. Styles have changed. In the last, say, five, ten years, there's changes. You look at a new house today as opposed to a house they built, say, just ten years ago. There are differences. Why? Because there's changes. We live in a society that continues to change and continues to want to change and continues to want that change. You buy a product at the store, you go home, you're so proud you brought, bought that product. Why? Because you've researched it, you've looked at it, you have admired it for a long time. And you go home, you turn on the TV set, you're so proud of the purchase that you've made. And guess what? Somebody's introducing that same product, but it's new and it's advanced. Why? Because we like change. And also, if you do new and advanced, guess what? You got more people to buy. And so we live in a time... That, as our journey through life is a continual changes, and then there's cheer. If we think about it, our happy times are more than our sad times. We remember our sad times more. Why? Because they're out of the norm. They're different. But our happy times are more. Don't you say, wouldn't you think today you've been happier? Well, maybe not the subject of death, but you've been happier today than you've been sad. Yesterday, weren't you happier more of the day than you were sad? Can you look at Bo and not be happy? No. My wife, if she wants to get happy now, she just flips out pictures of the grandbaby. Used to be pictures of me. Now it's the grandbaby. But we live in a constant state of cheer, happiness. But then our journey also has a constant. There's a constant that doesn't go away. It's a constant that's settled. It's a constant that does not move. It's a constant that's promised. In Matthew 28, lo, I am with you always, verse 20, even to the end of the age. I'm with you always. There's the constant. That is the constant that does not move. In all of life's journey, things change, things move. There's preparation and changes. There's choices to be made, and those choices may come up at different times and be different. There's conflict. There's all of these things, but there's the constant. Jesus Christ. As the old song goes, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking refuge for my soul, needing a friend who saves me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? There's the truth. There's the constant. That's the constant that we need in our life. That's the constant, however, that a lot of folks in making those choices choose not to have in their life. But it's the constant that's there. It's the constants that we rely upon. It's the constant that we can count on. It's the constant that's there through all of life's turns and twists. And so as we live our life, we live our journey, let us understand that all these things take place. And let us be sure that we grab that constant, Jesus Christ. But then as much as our life's a journey, our life is a journey that will one day end. Oh, here comes the sad part. Yeah, I'm going to warn you. Here comes the sad part. None of us really like to think about death. We're sort of like the king in the opening illustration. We don't like to think about death. And yet, we understand that death has come upon all of us because of Adam's sin. 
in Genesis chapter 2, Moses, in detailing the creation of the world, tells us that God placed in the Garden of Eden, he placed, first of all, a tree of knowledge, good and evil. But he also placed the tree of life. The tree of knowledge of good and evil was evidently the ability to discern, but it was also the, the forbidden fruit which God told Adam and Eve. He said, of the tree, the midst of the garden tree of knowledge of good and evil, he says, you will not eat. And the day you eat, you shall die. You keep reading the book of Genesis, flip a page, at least in my Bible, you flip it to Genesis chapter 3, and what do you find? You find Adam and Eve messed up. Adam and Eve had a choice. They chose not to listen to God, thus not to obey him. When you don't listen to God, you're not obeying him. And so they did exactly what God told them not to do. And so God, in speaking there towards the end of Genesis chapter 3, beginning about verse 20, says that man now has the ability to discern, and he says he wanted to be like us. So we're casting him out of the garden. And not only we cast him out of the garden, but we're putting a cherub there and a sword that turns in all degrees to protect him so that he cannot get back into the garden and not thus not having the right to the tree of life. Thus, guess what? Man made mortal. How do we know that? Well, man had to take on nourishment. And so if man had to take on nourishment, he was made mortal, but he had the opportunity to be immortal. Why? Because he had the right to the tree of life. And when Adam sinned and was cast out of the garden, guess what? He did not have the right or the opportunity to avail himself of anymore. You're right. The tree of life. And so Paul said in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, wherefore by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. So death has passed upon all of us for all have sinned. Now, some want to use verse 12 of Romans chapter 5 to talk and say, that's only talking about spiritual death. Okay, I agree. That's what the context seems to be talking about. But the application is still a valid point because that's what happened in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3. That tree of life, which John talks about in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation 3, it comes up again. It talks about being in heaven. Tree of life is what everybody had the opportunity to do, to have, but because of Adam's sin, we don't have that opportunity. And so now what happens? Well, the Hebrew writer reminds us in chapter 9 and verse 27, it's appointed to men once to die. It's appointed to men once to die, and after that, the judgment. While this mortal must put on immortality, is corruptible must put on incorruption there is a note which seems so final and that's first uh, first corinthians chapter 15 there's a note there that just seems so final in verse 50 man's got to change in death we look at it as job would say in job 18 verse 14 is the king of terrors that which is to be avoided that which we are not to have a part of that which is something we don't want to see, talk about, discuss at all. Yet, we know it's reality. Isn't it interesting when you read Genesis, if you're in Genesis, you read chapter 5, and you see all these folks that live, you know, hundreds of years. But isn't it interesting when you're reading that genealogy there, as you read, you know, there's where you find Methuselah and you, you find all these men of all these years. And for each one, do you know what it says at the very end? It says so-and-so lived so-and-so years and he died. Yeah. Death is a reality. A reality which we don't want to face a reality which we try our best to prolong our days and prolong our years. We go to the doctor. We should. No, I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. I'm not saying don't take the medicine that he provided. But do remember that one day the golden cord will be loosed. One day 
pot will be shattered. And one day we'll die. And the body, according to Ecclesiastes 12, that's 12, chapter 12, verse 6, chapter 12, verse 7, Solomon says, the body will return to the dust of the earth. We gather together then. We go to funeral homes and we go to churches and it's there that, that we go and we mourn the loss of our loved ones. Grief is a real process. Let, let me just step aside on the subject for just a minute. Grief is a real process. It takes time. It takes a lot of help. It is reality. Don't try to push it off and don't try to say it's not real. It is real. And when it happens to you, and grief happens not only at death, it happens anytime there is a separation. And that's interesting because then James chapter 2, then James remind us that, that, that as the, the body without the spirit is dead. Faith without works, so the body without the spirit is dead. The answer is yes. So grief is real, and, and, and grief, sometimes we need folks to help us get through it. Avail yourself of that help, whoever it may be. Back to the lesson. Death. As we come together in the funeral homes and churches and other places and graveyards to mourn the loss of our loved ones. We come in time, it's very solemn, knowing that we all face that fate, knowing that one day we'll pass from this earth. My father died in 2006. I think it was a couple of years later. I was with my mother one day, and I had taken her a couple of different places. I said, where do you want to go? And I knew really where she wanted to go, but... She didn't say, and I said, well, just ride with me for a while. Okay. So we went to the cemetery. We went to visit my father's grave and see the tombstone and make sure everything was fine and in order. And there, beside his marker, was hers. There was her birth date, 1927. And there was a dash. And there was an empty space. And all of a sudden, she just shuddered, and I grabbed her. You all right? Yeah. What's going on? You don't know how you feel till you look at that marker and realize that it's coming soon, and it's got your name on it. Yeah, I understand that. Because I've been beside too many people through my years of ministry say the same thing and experience the same thing. And while I don't, Suzanne and I don't have a marker anywhere, we understand the same is yet but our fate. And so, while we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, we understand that we have that which does not last forever. That which one day will come to an end. And so one day our journey really will end. But let's think a little bit further. What will end? Well, preacher, you just said it. The body will end. The body will go back to the dust of the earth. Yes. Our toils will end. Our trials will end. Our heartaches and our hurts will end, but also our times of, of, as we talked about a while ago, our times of choices and our times of preparation and our times of consistency, all, all those things will end. The only thing that won't end, of course, is the Lord, but also we won't end. David had a son with Bathsheba. Yes, I know it wasn't right. But at the same time, he did. The son, according to 2 Samuel 12, grew sick. Well, actually, chapter 10. Grew sick. And as the child grew sick, there is this wonder as David really, in many ways, begins to mourn before anything ever happens to the child. Doesn't shave. He doesn't clean up. He's a mess. He's a wreck. And the child dies. 
What does he do? He gets up. He cleans himself up. And all of a sudden, there is this murmuring through the house. What is going on with him? Why is he doing this? How could, how could he do this? He was fasting. He was mourning all before the child died. Now that the child has died, he seems to be relieved. And David reminds him. He cannot come back here. But I can go there. His time here on this earth is finished. But while my time is still existing, there will come a time in which it will be no more. Yes, if a man dies, Job says in Job 14, the question is asked, will he live again? Paul looked forward to death, didn't he? Paul looked forward to death and then he says, I'm in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain here in the flesh is more needful of you. But Paul said, look, I got to spend my life, and I got to know that one day it'll come to an end. So here's the conclusion of this point that I want you to understand. Make your choices. Make your time in this journey. Make it precious. Use it to the best of your ability. Use it wisely. Why? Because, because, guess what? Guess what? It's like the little boy that went into the store with his mama. And as he went into the store with his mama, oh, there was great rejoicing because she gave him $5. Well, you we know, $5 didn't buy much, so this tells you the, the crux. She grew impatient as he went from item to item to item to item to think about buying it. And she said, hurry up and pick out what you're going to buy. And he said, Mom, I only have five dollars. And once I spend it, it's gone. And the answer is, yeah. And so he said, I want to spend it wisely. Spend your time wisely. So then that leads us to the third point. See, Steve thought I was concluding. He's already started humming. Sorry, brother. I really wanted to stop you. I know. I know you got to be ready. You got to make that preparation. That's the first point. God bless you. But here's the point. I want you to live without regrets. If you have your Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, Paul, I think, gives us sort of a short little synopsis of how to live our life so that there are no regrets. How to live our life so that when this journey comes to an end, notice what the song says. Remember what Eliza Hewitt wrote in the song. As she, as she wrote in the song, she makes the statement, but when traveling days are o'er, not a shadow, not a sigh. How do you live so that there are no regrets? First Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, all says, flee these things. Flee what things? Flee what things? Contextually, in the first 10 verses of 1 Timothy 6, Paul's talking about greed. He's talking about learning to really be content with what you have and, and, and trying to seek after the things of this world. Paul says, flee that. But I think in many ways you can open that context even a little bit broader to all the things Paul was talking to Timothy about. Flee false teaching. Flee error. Flee things that, that Satan puts before you. Flee the world. And the worldly things. And so we live our life fleeing certain things. But then Paul says, but follow. Well, what are we going to follow? Paul says, follow righteousness. What's righteousness? Righteousness is right doing. In our life of choices, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, reminds us, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things should be added to you. Seek what is righteous. Seek God's way. And so he says, seek godliness. Seek the things that are of godly nature. Seek God's things, God's ways. In Psalm 50 and verse 15, the psalmist says, give thanks to the Lord. Pay your vows unto him. Have you ever made a vow to God? God, if you'll do this for me, I'll do that. 
Have you made your vow and then followed it? When you, didn't you make a vow when you became a child of God? God, I'll follow you wherever you lead me. I'll do whatever you say do. I want to be your child. Pay that vow in that life. Follow godliness. Faith, Paul says, is faith. Faith is, we say, well, faith is the substance of things. Hope for the evidence of things not seen. How many times have you read that and go, huh? Faith is the idea of accepting what you've been told and following it. It's the assurance that it's going to take place, that God's with you. The faith that says, you know, I don't see everything, and I'm walking not by sight but by faith. We're talking about on Sunday mornings right now in a mini-series uh, in Bible class on the providence of God. And to me, that is the walk of faith, to accept God's providence and to believe it. And so, by faith, Noah built an ark. Things that he had not seen by faith. Abraham walked with God by faith. Enoch walked with God by faith. These people did great things. By faith, we live our life. Or we walk by faith, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, not by sight. But then Paul says, follow love. What's love? Love is really wanting what is best for another. Now, somebody's going to ask me, preacher, was that agape love? Was that phileo love? Was that storge love? That was agape love that Paul is using here. It's the love that desires what is best for another Paul says, by love, you're to serve one another, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. So in other words, love is truly unselfish. It's looking out for what is best for others, and not only just best for others, because Paul would remind us, oh, no man, nothing but to love one another, but also love God and seek what is best for him. And so then Paul says, follow patience. Patience. What's patience? Well, it's just like what you think of. But it's the idea not just, well, you know, being calm in the midst of a storm. But the word patience here has the idea, the hupomene has the word idea of, of holding on when the storms come. Just holding on. Don't let go. Paul said, when you follow the idea of patience, you're not going to let go. You're going to hold on to God. Live your life with patience. Hold on to God as he holds to you. And then he says, follow gentleness. What's gentleness? Meekness, some versions say. Gentleness is the idea. I think the, there's really two definitions. It's the idea, first of all, of a horse that's tamed. The idea of meekness is really just that. It's, it's a horse that, that is able, you're able to put a bit in its mouth and you're able to control the, the, the horse. But one described another individual described gentleness this way. It's being angry at the sin in your life, but not being angry at the sin in the other person's life. In other words, you don't get angry at that person. You try to teach them, but you don't get angry with them, but you're angry with the sin in your life. Because you realize you're not there yet, but you're marching to Zion. Come we that love the Lord. Why? Because we're marching to Zion. But then you live your life with no regrets. You flee, you follow. But then Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Fight. It's the idea of a continual thing. It's not just a one-time thing when you became a Christian. It's a continual fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold. Lay hold is the idea of grasping as so as to not let go. You see, when you grabbed, if you will, the Lord, it was the idea or, surely, or should have been the idea. I'm not going to let go of the Lord. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to hold on for dear life. We have a picture. Suzanne and I have a picture. We don't put it out anymore. Suzanne and I have a picture. We weren't, uh, we were married, but we, this was B.E., before Ethan. We went to Gatlinburg. We go. We like Gatlinburg. We went to Gatlinburg. Well, we were young and adventurous, and so we went to Maggie Valley. We rode the sky lift, right? You got to get up there. There's a picture of Suzanne and I in this sky lift. I have one arm around her. I have one other hand on the bar. My wife has the bar with both hands and knuckles. You can see them are white, shining white. Why? Don't want anything to happen. 
Lord, love her. That's the idea. I'm holding on. I'm not letting go. And so I lay hold on eternal life in which I've made the good confession, Paul says. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. Life comes to an end. Let us be able to say, as Paul said, I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous George shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. Are you ready? Are you ready? There's coming today. We're going to be able to sing and shout the victory. If you're not, you can get ready this morning. All together we stand and sing.